little closer to home this time. Um, Mr. Mc, uh, Mr. McLeod is uh, an attorney. Um, he has a master's from Stanford, a law degree from UNSW, and he specializes in internet-related uh, issues. Today he wants to tell us about what patents really mean and how they're often abused. So let's welcome to the stage. business defense. That's really fantastic. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to say that uh, this is a 60-minute presentation done in 15, minute, 15 minutes, and uh, very few of you probably know much about patent law, and none of you have done the homework. So, uh, I'm going to speak really fast, far faster than I ever have uh, in any courtroom. I'm going to try not to trip over my words. I'm wondering, probably, why is it that the patent office issues patents on pseudoscience and homeopathy? You probably can't even believe that happens. Yesterday you heard that the FTC is cracking down on homeopathy. I'm here to tell you that the Patent Office is providing it legitimacy and probably will continue to do so. <clears throat> First of all, this is not legal advice. If you need legal advice, hire a lawyer. All right, if you don't know what a patent is, you probably know what an inventor is. You probably heard of some guys like Edison and his light bulb or this guy that revolutionized the fashion industry named Einstein with his patented blouse. <laughs> now, because you know about these really smart people, you probably have some ideas that uh, uh, patents are given to really brilliant people for doing really brilliant things and that they're really deeply evaluated, they're peer-reviewed. Uh, as Amy, uh, Adam and Jamie might say, uh, let's do some myth-busting. So, patented woo goes back centuries. It really does. Uh, th there was a time when if you took some remedy to the monarch and you cured someone, uh, made them feel better, they would issue what we call letters patent. They would officially recognize your ability to sell this compound. And this continued uh, uh, right through the 20th century. Uh, and it, the, the specialty, if you will, it became known as a patented medicine because it was officially sanctioned by an organization. But at that time, the U.S. did not officially recognize chemical patents. And in fact, those patented mes me uh, medicines, their formulas were kept secret. Whereas a U.S. patent, you actually have to tell somebody what goes into everything. Today, you can go to the USPTO website and search for homeopathic, homeopathy, something like that, like that in nature, you will find homeopathy and patents. Now, who cares if they're patented or not? Well, first of all, I can tell you the people who are selling the crap care if it's patented because it provides that legitimacy. They can put it in their advertising. My patented deal. And some of you probably have heard of this guy named Berzinski yeah. and the cancer treatment and his eight patents on his cancer treatment. And he still advertises that today. You care because you want things to be validated in some way, scientifically, that they would work and that they're going to provide relief. And of course, the people that are going to take it, they want to know because they might die if they don't. So, we come to this example. This is a recent U.S. patent application. I selected it because, well, homeopathic is in the title. And the guy who's applied for it is from Las Vegas. Um, and the claim is so simple that everyone here should be able to understand it. He's basically saying, I have a treatment for interstitial lung disease. That's a broad category of things, but just to pick one, think of asbestosis or mesothelioma. And he's saying if you take some tea tree oil, some vinegar, and some aloe vera, you have a treatment. Yeah. Now, in non patent lingo, this means that if I take an ounce of, of the uh, tea tree oil, an ounce of aloe vera, and an ounce of vinegar, and I mix that up with 40% of every, anything else on this planet that I can find, I have a treatment. Does anyone believe that works? Anyone? Anyone? Just raise your hand. Okay. So, you don't know anything about patent law? This is patent law in three minutes. 
What can be patented? Literally, it's, it's incredibly broad. Any new useful process, machine, manufacturer, composition of matter. It sounds like it's everything under the sun. The key words are, it's got to be new, not done before. It's got to be useful, works for its intended purpose. And then so the statutory classifications of things that we we'll look at. What is a patent? It's a right to exclude other people from making, using, or selling uh, what it is that you claim. The patent itself is supposed to teach the person of ordinary skill in the art exactly how to make and use the thing that you've claimed for its intended purpose. They come in different types. Utility is the one that we care about. The utility patent has two main portions. It has specification, that's the text and drawings uh, uh, that tell you, it's the instruction manual that tells you how this thing works. And it has the claims, and this is the legal boundaries that give a notice to other people, don't steal my stuff. They generally are good for 20 years, and that will become important later. What can't you patent? Well, you can't patent mathematical formulas, and so our, our dear friend Albert Einstein, E equals MC squared, theory of relativity, all that other good stuff we associate with it, completely unpatentable. Completely. Uh, another thing that we'll point out, naturally occurring substances. We probably know there's a periodic table and everything from 1 to 92 is naturally occurring, can be found in nature. Those can't be patented. What about new things? Well, it just so happens that this guy, Glenn Seaborg, made new element. Element 95, he also made element 96. And because he was the first person to actually teach someone how to make this element, he was awarded a patent for that. So, back to our example. This is a composition of matter, isn't it? Yes. It is. So, is it new? Is it useful? Click. How do you get a patent? Well, that's the key. That is the key. The process begins when this guy puts together a piece of paper that uh, explains what it is he claims and what it is he can do. He sends it to the patent office with a big check. Patent office looks at it and says, well, what are we going to think of this? Well, let's give it to an examiner and see what he says. This is what an examiner does. He reads the application. He looks at the claims. He looks for prior art. Has anyone done this before? And then he writes up a piece of paper and sends it back to the uh, uh, applicant and says, this is what I think of your application. When he does this, the examiner's entire work with this patent application is classified into these tasks. He sends an office action, maybe a second, maybe a third. He does all of this work until he finally gets to a stage where he's either allowed the patent or he's finally rejected it. This entire process is called a production unit, and this is key. Why? Because the examiner is given a very limited amount of time to review the patent, and this time will be spread over a course of two to three years. And if we see here, a mechanical patent, a simple mechanical patent for fishing lure, he gets 16.6 hours. Let's ramp that up to a satellite communication system. He doesn't even get twice as much time to evaluate if this actually works. And immunother immunotherapy, somewhere in the middle. That's not a lot of time. What does he not do? He does not analyze whether it works. There's no, there's extremely low threshold for utility. Basically, if you write in the application that my thing is useful, the examiner will say, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take the word for it. No working model requirement. That goes back hundreds of years, or actually about 150. Um, the only exceptions to that currently, to my knowledge, are things like cold fusion. If you claim perpetual motion or reversing aging, Someone in the patent office is going to want you to come down and prove it. But short of that, they're not going to evaluate if it works. It's not going to be peer reviewed. None of that is going to be performed. In reality, in that limited amount of time, the examiner is going to skim the specification. He's going to look at the claims. He's going to pick out some keywords. He's going to use those for a search of a patent database and see if he can find that anyone's done it before. He's going to map that disclosure against your claimed invention, and then he's going to decide whether or not he's going to lie on your patent and send you something about that. There's a lot of flaws in this process. <laughs> Only a few. Uh, again, that, that limitation on time. The fact that someone can make up words to put in their claims. I put in here extrudingly 
Last week, I actually saw in a patent claim from Sandoz, I believe it was, anti-neoplastonically. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the patent or the examiner may not think of synonyms to search for when he does this. I mean, here it talks about vinegar. Do you think he searched for acidic acid? Or ethanolic acid? No, he didn't. Uh, the patent office's database is quite small. Uh, the examiners are educated, but they're not experts. These are not the leading researchers in the field. They're smart people, but they're under a uh, real time crunch, and, and it's very hard for them to keep up. There's policy reasons as well. The government favors the issuance of more patents. Why? Because more patents bring in more money, more patents makes our uh, country look stronger, or have better intervention, better rates of innovation than others. In fact, we've had massive fights in the patent uh, world over whether more patents is better if there are lots of bad patents. What I'm basically saying is there's no political will to change this. Back to our example. In reality, you see a set of terms that the examiner can provide a search for. And when I read this application, I was pretty sure there would not be any medical literature that covered all four of those things. And I was right. I was right. First of all, you know, you don't see percentages of ingredients in most things, except pesticides. He wasn't claiming a pesticide, although his composition may actually be a pesticide. <laughs> and so this happened. In September, the patent issued. That primary seat, uh, set of keywords came up with no prior art. However, the examiner made him cha or change the title for him. He removed homeopathic because the dilution percentage was not consistent with homeopathy. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't add enough water, so you can't call it homeopathic. <laughs> and he also uh, uh, went to some narrow claims that actually explained what you're supposed to do with this. You put it in a humidifier and you inhale it, and supposedly your asbestosis will feel better. Bad patents happen everywhere. This is how we get things like the method of swing on swing, the method of exercising a cat using a laser pointer. That's just amazing. And my, my favorite, this is the one that inspired the talk, came out several years ago, Diane's Mana. And uh, you know, it's a wall of text, but basically, it's a claim to cure pants, cancer pain and bipolar disorder consisting of eating food. <laughs> and I suspect that the only real active ingredient in this list is the wine, and it just really makes you feel um, a little bit better. If you're not convinced, here's another uh, infamous patent from 1987. Uh, this is a method for keeping a severed head alive in a cabinet. <laughs> it was issued in 1987. If anyone thinks you could keep a severed head alive in 1987, uh, now I know there were some horror movies, they saved Hitler's brain, that's a really impossible film, but I don't think he would actually do it. Now, killing these patents is very hard work. They can only be killed during their enforcement period, which is a very short period of time, and it takes a lot of money to do it. And if no one's going to actually sue someone on that patent, then there's no economic will to chase them down. But once they expire, they are forever. So Mr. Brzezinski and his clinic can continue to claim that they have a patented cancer treatment method. And they can continue to, uh, uh, to obtain money uh, from people who are desperate. And that's a problem. I have no solution for it. I'm here to tell you. That today, if someone tells you, my thing is patented, I have this amazing cure, I have this amazing uh, substance that will make your life better, your number one response should be, so what? <laughs> the fact that you have a patent doesn't mean anything because the patent office never tested what you did. There's no peer review. There's nothing out there, in fact, that uh, sets out that you've done anything useful. And that should be your response. And you don't have to have a technical degree in that field to say that. You can, you can offer that up, and it's a, it's a solid basis. I've got more information here. I could say lots of 
more things. I could take more time, but I'm not. Again, thank you, Ray. Oh, I wanted to say I never thought Amazing Randy would be my opening act. <laughs> Please vote on November 6th. That's your opportunity to stand. Thank you.